Um, Jim, how many years has it now been that you've been the manager at the state park? I try to remember and I sometimes forget. So this is going on to the 13th year now. All right. All right. Yeah. And Dan Adams has been here for three years longer than I was. He's a park supervisor. So between the two of us, we've been here for a while. Yeah. Um, is, the continuity has been great. Okay, so thanks, Patrick. I, I appreciate the introduction, and uh, thanks for hosting these presentations and for giving me the opportunity to talk about what's happened at Ludington State Park over the past couple of years, and to discuss some of the upcoming projects that we have for 2024 and 2025. But before I do that, I do want to thank the Friends Ludington State Park Board and membership for all their volunteering and fundraising efforts. The Friends group supports, you know, support for the park has helped provide many of the improvements that we've implemented recently, the installation of the Hamlin playground, acquisition of the action track chair and the beach wheelchairs, and the accessible kayak launch are just a few of the improvements that the Friends Group has helped fund. They've also helped fund our guest presenter series. They provide volunteers for highway cleanups, our Adopt-A-Trail program, and our invasive street, uh, species treatment programs. So you really make the park a better place. I thank you for that. So while I'm sure that a lot of people are going to want to hear about our upcoming major projects, I'm going to start off with a quick overview of the park and then discuss some of the improvements that have been made over the past year or so. I was unable to do this last season, so I'm going to cover projects that we did in 2022 and 23. Then after that, I'll jump into the upcoming projects and how they'll impact park visitors and uh, the park itself. After that, hopefully we'll have time to open it up for some questions. So Ludington State Park, uh, it's it's a comprised of, I'm sorry, part of my screen is covered by uh, the Zoom keys there. But uh, so the park is comprised of approximately 5,400 acres of open and wooded sand dunes between the shore of Lake Michigan and Hamlin Lake. The park is roughly eight miles north of downtown Ludington and can be accessed by Lakeshore Drive and Highway 116. This is a park overview um, on the north end of the park. We abut Nordhaus Dunes Wilderness Area on the south end, private property. And then this park is bisected by the Big Sobble River as it concludes its journey from the Sobble Lakes in Lake County to Lake Michigan. Park includes approximately seven miles of beautiful beaches along Lake Michigan, and nearly five miles of undeveloped shoreline along Hamlin Lake, uh, with the shoreline consisting of wetlands, beaches, and dunes. So Hamlin Lake, which is about 5,000 acres, is created by the impoundment of the Big Sable River by the Hamlin Dam. This dam, which according to historians and who you talk to, could be either the fourth or fifth version of a dam on the site, was built in 1913 after the collapse of the previous dam. So the dam was originally built to assist with lumbering operations at the small town of Hamlin, which was located where the park is, you know, along the Big Sable River. It had uh, sawmills and shingle mills, a schoolhouse, and a few residents. I've heard somewhere in the range of 60 to 100 people lived here uh, during that time period. In 1988, the dam uh, that was existing at that time uh, blew out, and it, it wiped out much of the village of Hanlon. They rebuilt the dam, continued kind of on limited operations until 1912 when the dam failed again, and that really spent like ended uh the uh town of hamlin at that time it was abandoned shortly after that i recommend joining one of our park interpreter alan Wernett's history hikes to learn more about this he does a lot of history of hamlin in this lumbering era uh, so you can check out the uh, friends group calendar our facebook page alan promotes a lot of the events through there and he'll have some events happening this summer so the park operates a dam under the guidance of a transfer deed that transferred the dam to the Department of Conservation, which was the precursor to our DNR now. The transfer deed requires that the lake level be lowered two feet below the summer level for the winter months to avoid ice damage to the many seawalls and dock structures around the lake. And then once the ice is off of the lake in March or April, according to the deed, we again can raise the lake to its summer level. We just started doing that uh, a week and a half ago. And currently from the winter levels, um, we've raised the gates uh, about a foot and a half and the water level has come up about six to eight inches. So we also monitor the lake level and adjust it if necessary, at least once per day. And maintaining these lake levels is something we take seriously. I get more phone calls about water levels on Hanlon Lake than probably any other issue that we have here. 
So as I mentioned, the Big Sable River flows through the middle of the park for roughly a mile from the dam to the river mouth. Uh, the river is a very popular fishing location. In the spring, it's primarily for steelhead. Uh, in the fall, it's uh, primarily for salmon. Um, we, we plant um, with the partnering with the fisheries division and the local charter boat association. Uh, we plant salmon each spring. Uh, in the past, it was primarily Chinook salmon, but more recently, we've been planting coho and releasing them. During the summer, the river is popular for paddlers and tubers. I've heard it referred to as the lazy river, and that lazy river draws large crowds on the warmest days of summer. With so many miles of beautiful sandy beaches, it shouldn't be surprising to learn that swimming and sunbathing are probably our most popular summer activities. Uh, the CCC built Lake Michigan Beach House kind of anchors that main designated swim beach. Just to the south of that, there is a pet friendly beach. But if visitors are looking for getting to less crowded areas in the park, there are plenty of other sections of the beach to hike to, or you can access the three miles along M116 as well. You tend to see fewer people in those areas. The Big Sable Point Lighthouse is another major draw at the park. This lighthouse is owned by the state of Michigan, but it's leased to the Sable Dunes Lighthouse Keepers Association, and they maintain the lighthouse and keepers quarters and open the lighthouse up for tours. This organization, which you know, was started locally by very passionate uh, residents who wanted to save the Big Sable Point Lighthouse, has brought this lighthouse back to life um, from the disrepair it was in back in the 1970s and 80s. The park also has 25 miles of marked trails. And you have a lot of different options when you're out on those trails. You've got the open dunes, forested dunes, wetlands. You can um, use the, uh, again, the Lazy River is probably another trail through the park itself. And the park contains two signed canoe and kayak trails. One that goes around Lost Lake, which is fairly close to the main Hamlin Day Use area and beach. And another that goes through the carp ponds that are at the south end of the park, um, kind of close to the north end of Piney Ridge Road. For those interested in fishing and hunting, the park allows both. At least two thirds of the park is open to hunting during the designated seasons. Uh, fishing opportunities are at Hamlin Lake, along the river, even shoreline fishing for brown trout, uh, oftentimes in the fall and in the spring. Very popular locations. So Ludington State Park is the leader in camping for Michigan State Parks. There's no other park that comes close. We have 374 campsites that include everything from modern campsites to mini cabins to rustic hike-in sites. During the summer, it can be pretty tough to get a campsite at Ludington. We take reservations six months in advance for campsites. Most people that I've talked to recommend reserving online if you can, but you can also call the state park reservation line to get a campsite. Persistence, 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 and maybe a little flexibility in your dates is gonna help with success. There's no trick to it. It's really just people being persistent. And then I'd like to um, also remind everyone that we are open year round and winter activities when we actually have a winter, are a great way to get out um, and, and enjoy nature. We groom nearly 10 miles of ski trails. Uh, we lead snowshoe hikes you know, throughout the forest. We host lantern lit snowshoe and skiing events with the friends group. The Cedar Campground and Jack Pine walk-in sites are open for camping year round, as are the park's three mini cabins. Though we don't have running water at this time of year, so flush toilets are not an option, nor is hot water. I'm just gonna do a quick overview of the staff that we have at the park. Uh, we have 12 permanent employees. Uh, and these are people who are, you know, dedicated civil servants that uh, work at the park. Not all of us work year round, but uh, some of us do. So, um, you know, we have three people in our administrative staff and that's, you know, we've got Dan Adams who's in the center there. He's the park supervisor and he, he covers the day-to-day -day operations in the park. He sets work lists, sets the schedules. Uh, Jessica uh, Young, who was recently hired at the park, she's our accounting assistant. She handles bills, payroll, contracts, revenue, and a whole host of other administrative duties. She's been a great addition to the park and she's probably the person you're gonna talk to first when you call the park or when you stop by in the six months that our main entrance is closed. And then I'm the park manager. So I manage the park as a whole, work with budgets, large projects, uh, human resources side of things. And then I have also included at the bottom 
uh, Alan Wernett. He's our park interpreter, and many people may not know this, but Alan is actually part of another agency. He's not a Parks and Recreation Division employee. He works for the DNR's Marketing and Outreach Division. So Marketing and Outreach does just what it says. It, it uh, markets state parks, markets, uh, hunting and fishing within the state, promotes natural resource activities, and then the outreach part is more of the education stand uh, or side of things, you know. So Alan gets out, he works with school groups throughout the community and throughout the state, and he also does a lot of programming within the park as well for visitors and school children. Uh, this is the rest of our permanent park staff. Um, we've got seven commissioned park officers that work at the park, two are full time, and the remaining five work eight to nine months out of the year. The guy in the straw hat is Paul Klein, he's our full time lead ranger. He's been working here for as long as I have. Uh, he's a great resource, contributes a lot, is very passionate about working with the friends group. Matt Farber is our full-time maintenance ranger. He's the guy that's hiding behind the stump grinder. Uh, seasonal rangers are Brandon Needle, giving you the thumbs up. Brock Boderenbrode uh, to the left of the table. Riley Keffer in the high lift, getting ready to top a tree. Andrew Studnicka to the right of the green table. And Nate Gilson, who's working on cutting down a, a tree. It's a young crew. Uh, we've lost quite a few rangers in the past couple of years to promotions to other parks. And while we're happy for them, it, it always means with a big turnover, there's a little bit of a learning curve. Um, Nate, Riley, and Andrew, they started working here in October and were laid off in November. So they've got very little time, but they've been a great addition so far. So we feel like we have a really good team. And then we also do have two seasonal janitors. Uh, one position is vacant, and we're in the process of filling that. And then Mike Collins, who's in the upper right-hand corner, he's our other permanent janitor. So we couldn't do it without this next group here. This is our summer staff. Um, our summer staff, you know, we've got approximately 20 uh, summer staff that work for us during the, the summer. They work six months out of the year. They're limited at that, unfortunately, uh, because they do a really big share of the work at the park. Um, you know, we were able to hire them each summer. Uh, they're our frontline staff. They do maintenance, janitorial work. They are probably the people that you first see when you come to the park and that you will talk to if you need to talk to anyone at the park. So uh, we really couldn't do it without them. We also partner with a couple of organizations that add a lot of help to, you know, operating this park. One of them is the Friends Group. Um, as we mentioned earlier, they help us fund amenities that would otherwise be difficult for us to purchase. They host events for our visitors, and they contribute to the park with volunteer projects. They also provide volunteers for the Ludington Brew Fest event in January that is put on by the Ludington Chamber of Commerce. I believe that's their largest fundraiser, um, and I know that it's a, it's a big benefit to the community to be able to host that event as well. The other organization we work with is the Sobel Dunes Lighthouse Keepers Association. So this, their dedication to preserving our historic lights and opening them up to the public for educational opportunities is very much appreciated by Parks and Rec Division. This would be a difficult task for us to, to perform. So between 18,000 and maybe 20,000 visitors climb that light each year to take in the surrounding park and to learn about what it was like to operate a lighthouse so far out in the wilderness because before this park was dedicated, there wasn't a road anywhere near this area. So it's a really good educational opportunity to have people that can get out there, get up in that lighthouse and, and see what people had to go through to operate that. Uh, Splicka had a couple of projects of note recently. Uh, the state of Michigan worked with them to fund some repairs along the seawall that protects the big Sobel Point from Lake Michigan. As you may remember a few years ago, we had very high water and the the high water combined with the heavy wave action knocked off a lot of the steel cap around the seawall. That allowed more water to pool behind the seawall and actually it started flooding the basement and flooded a lot of the area around the lighthouse. So we were starting to get pretty concerned with that and the impact it would have on the foundation. Uh, so we funded some repairs for the seawall. And then Sable Points Lighthouse Keepers Association has also been working with Parks and Rec Division and the State Historical Preservation Office uh, to, to put together their uh, historic structures report. And so this report documents the history of the light station 
its architectural features, identifies areas that need repair, and it designates a period of interpretation for the lighthouse. And so that period of interpretation is, you know, a, a, it's a time frame, a snapshot in time, because this lighthouse has existed through a lot of different iterations. You know, it, at one point it was the tower and a part of the house, and then another section of the house was added on and different structures were added and removed and the interiors were modeled in different ways. So the, the period of interpretation actually picks out a time frame within that 150 plus years that the lighthouse was in place and says, from now on, we're going to interpret this building in this period. So it gives us a little bit of a roadmap for both Splica and Parks and Rec Division, laying out how the house is gonna be maintained and how we're going to interpret it for future visitors. So we're really excited to see this historic structures report come out. Uh, we've done a few drafts, gone through a few drafts and learned a lot of really cool stuff about the lighthouse that we did not know. So to the right, there's a, a, a drawing of uh, the metal casing that they placed on, which was placed on just before the turn of the century, right around, I think, 1899, 1900. So great project, something that we've long wanted to have because this really guides what we do with that lighthouse in the future. So during the last couple of years, we've also had a few smaller projects that we've worked on in the park. Um, we've got over 20 buildings and structures, so roofing is always on our list. Um, just if we do one every couple of years, that's still 40 years um, between replacing roofs, and that's too long. So uh, in 2022, we were able to re-roof the park's main workshop, and then this fall, when the park is closed, we're going to be re-roofing the Hamlin Beach House and possibly some of the other smaller buildings. We had a well failure at the Jack Pine Campground that has required the installation of a new well, so we got that completed. Uh, we've worked on erosion control projects throughout the park, and we've had to work on a few of our lift stations, our septic systems. Uh, we pump a lot of sewage, so lift stations are a priority. Uh, they fail, and, and they're expensive to fix, so we've been working on that. And then we have a lot of boardwalks throughout the park, and some of those are starting to age. Um, if you'd walked out on the island trail recently, you may have noticed it was fairly spongy. It was kind of shifting in some areas as well. And, and so those needed a lot of work. We had uh, our lead worker, Paul Klein, and uh, summer worker, Craig Nason, who has retired from his second career this summer. Uh, I think he's been here for over 25 years working as a summer worker for us. And a lot of the, the infrastructure you see here, the trash cans and kiosks have all been built by Craig. So we're really going to miss him. But Craig, Paul, and uh, Summer Ranger Levi Wilson spent a lot of their late summer and fall 2023 strength, strengthening those structures. They're going to continue this during the fall of 2024. And then in addition to a lot of the infrastructure projects, Protecting the resource is a major charge for us. Uh, the discovery and spread of the hemlock woolly adelgid, a devastating forest pest, has kept our staff and stewardship team busy. Uh, we have an AmeriCorps worker who works out of Ludington State Park, as well as an AmeriCorps team out of the Muskegon area that spend much of the year identifying uh, trees that have been infested with hemlock woolly adelgid and then treating them during the treatment period. Uh, park staff is also working to limit the spread of this as well uh, by just trimming branches to keep RVs and people from brushing up against the hemlock and spreading the pests. Unfortunately, hemlock woolly adelgid also moves through migrating birds and animals. Uh, most recently, we've learned that it has uh, moved up to Antrim County, which is the, the furthest point north in this area. It's a devastating pest. Um, once a, a hemlock becomes infested, and if it's not treated, uh, hemlocks can die within about four years from there. And if anyone's been to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, you'll see large patches of hemlocks that have died from hemlock woolly adelgid. We keep hoping for really cold winters because that's something that can help slow down their spread, but this was definitely not the case this year. Uh, we also spend time uh, working with our volunteers and our stewardship team treating Japanese barberry, garlic mustard, oriental bittersweet. These are all invasive plants that can um, overtake native plants in this type of environment. So we're trying to eradicate those from the park. We've done a lot of treatment, especially this winter. And then we do continue our Great Lakes uh, piping plover monitoring program. We've been doing that since the late 90s. 
And while it's been a few years since we've had a successful nesting pair, there are a lot of birds passing through and we've had some attempts at nests. Hopefully the lower water levels will be more conducive to successful nesting this year. Um, a lot of those higher water levels pushed the birds out of the uh, interdoodle ponds that have the nice gravel or cobble that uh, piping plovers like. And so they moved to uh, other spots to the north where uh, they had good nesting situations. And then I'm just going to wrap up the overview of the park by touching on a few of the larger projects that we had over the past couple of years. These are our capital out outlay projects that are big ticket items um, where we usually work with a contractor to perform the work. So the beach wood restrooms, um, this is uh, kind of a two year headache that we had that impacted our camping seasons for both 2022 and 2023. Um, we really hoped that these would have been an easier project to get completed. Seems like an easy task, just replace a couple of buildings, but we had a lot of problems with that. They started in the fall of 2021. We hired a contractor to replace them and it didn't work out so well. Um, they were able to demolish them. And uh, then we ran into issue after issue with the construction itself. In 2023, I mean, we were able to open up one of the buildings during the season of, uh, of 2020, 2022, I'm sorry, lost track of the dates there. Um, the other one was incomplete and we just had to call that a loss for the season. But uh, by July of 2022, we were able to get one of the buildings open and then we brought in a new contractor in 2022 to complete the second building and to do repairs on the, the first building that they completed because we weren't happy with the performance and the, the product. And I just want to give a big thank you to Vertex. That's the contractor that came in and did the work on the buildings and, and completed the project. And to Josh and his crew at Heirloom Construction, a local company, they did great work for us, uh, replacing a lot of the the poor quality stuff that we saw there. It was really nice to work with a local company, a lot of passion for this part with that group, and we thank them. So by June of 2023, we had our new buildings opened and completed. Part of that building replacement project was also to replace the aging middle and north Beechwood electrical system. The old system was installed early 80s. Um, it had seen better days. We were constantly replacing outlets uh, breakers, and, and these were components that you just couldn't get off the shelf anymore. So it became a very expensive uh, project to make these repairs. Um, the other issue was that this this uh, campground electrical system was installed and designed at a time when RV units weren't as large as they are now. People didn't bring as many um, electronic or electric uh, devices as they do now. And they were set up to where there was one pedestal to be shared with four campsites in a lot of cases. So if you were, you weren't one of the first two people to arrive, forget it, you didn't have 30 amp service. So we were able to update that system with new pedestals, one per site. Uh, we also made some improvements to the campsites themselves, installing seven, uh, you know, seven campsites that were paved for people with disabilities. It was a nice improvement to the park. And then the last project we have, a uh, major project that we have for this year is just wrapping up right now. And it's not a very glamorous project, but it's a very important. The Cedar Campground septic tanks and lift station had failed. Uh, it was approximately 40 years old. So we hired Halleck out of heart to replace the tank, the lift station and the pumps. Again, not a glamorous job, but it's imperative that we have operating systems. So that's what has happened over the past couple of years. It's a really brief, um, a brief overview because I knew that uh, people would be interested in learning a bit about the upcoming projects. So I wanted to save plenty of time for that. So I'm going to pivot into what will hopefully be happening this fall and into next year. And I only say hopefully because we're still working through the design and the permitting process. And, you know, once we get the design done and we go out to bid and get the bids back, you know, some of the bids might dictate what we can complete here. And also some what permits we receive might impact that as well. So we have a budget to stay within and we've, we've got to stay within that. So why are we doing these projects now and where did the money come from? Well, typically in a given year, the entire state park system gets between eight, 10, maybe $15 million in capital outlay funds. And the, again, that's those 
dollars that pay for those really big ticket projects. And that's for 103 different state parks. So big, big projects only come around so often despite whatever our needs are. With the Federal America Rescue Plan Act, each state received a certain number of dollars for pandemic relief. And in Michigan, our Governor Whitmer signed the Build Michigan Together Plan in 2022. Um, and all of that money was going towards infrastructure projects. And out of that, $250 million was given towards parks infrastructure. Now, some of that went towards a grant program to assist local parks, um, another portion of funds was uh, given to a partnership in Flint to create 104th state park in Flint, but the rest of it went to our existing state parks. So our biggest needs at this time, when we, you know, we look at our capital improvement lists are to repair and improve our roads and parking and to replace the aging skyline trail. These are big ticket items that are really hard to fund in normal years. So we see this as an extraordinary opportunity for us. So, why did we choose those projects? And you know, if you've been to the park, you'll know why. You know, the roads are rough, parking lots are even rougher. Sometimes we, we're amazed that the parking lots are even staying together. It's mostly cold patch in some areas. There's also a need to address the congestion around the park entrance and to improve pedestrian and bicycle flow to allow our visitors to move safely through the park. So I've put together um, some very crude graphics to kind of show you um, why we're focusing so much energy and so much of the funds towards improving the entrance to the park. And again, I apologize for the graphics. I don't have a very good graphic program. And even if I did, I don't know how to use them. And it, it probably wouldn't look so good either. So this is kind of a snapshot on a busy day in the summer. And like I mentioned earlier in the, uh, in the presentation, you know, tubing is a very popular activity on the Big Sabo River. And at the same time as that, we've got vehicles coming and going from the park, sometimes faster than we'd like, quite often very distracted, looking out at Lake Michigan to the left or looking at the tubers coming down on the right. Um, if you look up in the upper right hand corner, there's an orange arrow and, and that's representing uh, the, uh, the dedicated paths that we have that connect all of the campgrounds with the Hamlin day use area and the park's warming lot. And while they're really good for getting people around that area where they fail is when they get to the warming shelter in the, in the area around the Pines campground. Our current, our current layout just doesn't provide any dedicated paths to Lake Michigan. So some people as they're trying to get to Lake Michigan, you know, they follow the, the bike path like we hope they would, but then it dumps people off in the warming shelter parking lot. Others, they like to take the shortcut and they'll follow right down the road. They'll just walk right down the middle of the road or right down the side. And once you get people in the road, then that starts slowing people down for traffic. People start stopping. Um, people are swerving into other lanes. Uh, we also have people, you know, that are moving from the Lake Michigan parking area trying to find the lighthouse, you know, so they're, or they're heading back to their campsite. So they're coming through the park entrance which is already quite narrow. It's about, actually, it isn't even two full vehicle widths. Um, so it's a narrow spot to have a lot of people and uh, vehicles, you know, interacting on that area there. And then, you know, we're getting more cars as the day gets busier, we're getting more cars coming in. Tubers are getting out on the south side of the river, which is a sandy area, it's easier to get out on. And then they're heading back into the park and they're walking across the highway bridge adjacent to the people who are not paying attention, most likely, and are looking out towards the river or the river mouth. Uh, so it's it's a really congested area. You go even further, you've got more and more people, the people trying to get to the beach or trying to find it, the lighthouse, you know, people are lost because our wayfaring, wayfinding isn't very good right now for that. Um, and, and our paths don't make sense. So we really, you know, see that there's a lot going on and we need to do something about it. As we get even further, you know, it's more crowded. Cars are starting to circle around the warming shelter lot looking for spaces or circling around Lake Michigan or they're stacking up because there aren't enough parking spaces. The tubers are crossing the road um, where they shouldn't be. They're hiking on both sides of the road. And then we add bikes. And, you know, if you've ever been to the park, you've seen it. You know, the big, you know, the, the uh, Lake Michigan beach house. I don't know if we could ever put enough bike racks there to be able to accommodate all of the, the bikes. 
it's it's just it's too congested. And so what we want to do is take a look at this. We're working with designers to see what can we do to improve not only the speed of people getting into the park, but we also want to see how we can move people safely through the park, um, get our pedestrians and our bicyclists separated from the vehicles, um, get more parking spaces so we don't have as much stacking. How do we get the tubers from the south side of the river safely either back up to the start of the river or over to the Lake Michigan beach house? So those are all the things that we're looking at in a typical in a typical day. And we're trying to solve these issues. So this is just an example. And this is a drastic example. This is the Chloe, Klein, Chloe Kimes concert. Um, and this was, we had blocked traffic to not even allow vehicles in. But this isn't too far from reality at some times. Uh, this is a little bit slower day, uh, but you can see again, motorcycle shared with bikes, pedestrian. I took a couple other pictures this day as well that have vehicles in the mix as well. So we want to try to try to get that taken care of. And then if you've been in here, you've seen the condition of our roads. Some of these sections are mostly cold patch. Um, this is the exit. This is just a portion of the middle of the park. And this is the Hamlin day use area parking lot. Huge potholes, and we've been repairing them the best we can. But these parking lots, you know, when they were installed, in some cases, it's like three quarters of an inch to an inch of asphalt there. There's just not much there. And, and we're hoping to do a lot better with those repairs coming up in this project. So we'll start off explaining what we're planning on doing uh, with the entrance area first. And that's this area within the yellow box or rectangle. We're hoping to separate um, all of the non-motorized activity from the actual roads themselves. And the exit road coming out of the park is really a lot wider than it needs to be, even for semis and, and large RVs and buses. So we're going to put a dedicated non-motorized pathway on the west side of the exit road. It'll be separated by a shoulder and a curb but this will help move people from, you know, south of the footbridge. Um, people are just walking down to the bridge to look out over the river. Bicyclists coming and going, pedestrians, to get people off of that roadway. We're also going to, I guess, armor would be one way to say it, uh, the area around our contact station or our entrance booth. Uh, since I've been here, the booth has been struck three times or at least come close to it. I've, I would say not quite struck because one vehicle hit a flagpole. Um, and I know of four instances since 1990, there may be others. Our, our staff who work that booth are very concerned with, you know, the speed at which people come in there. And there are some limits to what we can do with speed because of it's a state highway to the south. But we're hoping to kind of set up some barriers around there that, that make it a little bit easier for them to work there and make them feel a little bit safer. So this is uh, kind of continuing north of that entrance booth. You can see we're going to continue that non-motorized trail over to the Lake Michigan beach house area. We're going to try to get crosswalks in place, see if we can get people to cross at the crosswalks, putting crosswalks closer to stop signs is safer for everyone. So we're hoping clear wayfinding signage as well will help with this. One area, this area at the booth, and we've had a lot of requests for people saying, hey, can you put a, a kind of a bypass lane next to the booth for those of us that are camping here or those of us that don't have recreation passports? And we just don't have the space there. Um, that wet, wetlands on either side really limits how far, and we really looked long and hard at that to see if we could do that, and it just was not going to work out. But we are able to add a left-hand turn lane at the stop sign. And we see that as kind of one source of congestion at that intersection is, you know, the campers or the people going to Hamlin Lake, if they're not waiting in a left-hand turn lane, it will be a lot easier for them to get uh, that right-hand turn in and get on their way while waiting, while the vehicles are waiting in the left-hand turn lane. We're also going to make that a four-way stop. It really acts as a four-way stop right now because there's so much confusion. You know, people are on vacation, not always looking at the signs and, you know, we're just going to make it an official four-way stop and hopefully that'll uh, clean things up a little bit as well. So the uh, warming shelter, or some people call it the fish lot because of the fish cleaning station there, that's the area in red. Um, this is the current look, actually almost exactly, taken almost exactly a year ago. 
Uh, you can see how the bike paths and stuff, um, they just end at the warming shelter lot. They don't make their way into uh, the Lake Michigan area. Um, we leave people looking with no clear way to get to the lighthouse from the beach or from the campgrounds to the beach. So we're going to be installing uh, and realigning a lot of the walkways. We're gonna keep the existing one that's going in front of the warming shelter because that is part of the snowshoe activity and a, a lot of our interpreters um, interpretive walks and hikes start there. So we still want that to be kind of a hub of activity, but we're also going to align the walkways in a way that hopefully will encourage people to stay on them instead of jumping off into the road. Um, that should you know, allow people to move better with the traffic, stay safer by staying off of the roads themselves. We're also going to kind of pivot the alignment of the parking area. Right now it runs on roughly a north-south axis. So we're gonna turn that east and west because we've got the old sanitation station, which is kind of at the tip of the left side of the arrow uh, that we abandoned 10 years ago and it's not doing anything right now. And we can gain some parking from that location as well. So we're going to do that. And then we're gonna to try to improve access to the lighthouse. Um, good wayfinding signage is gonna really help us out, but also having a path that goes from that main pedestrian path that runs roughly southwest, northeast by the Pines campground. We're gonna get people off of the road um, going into Pines because there's a lot of traffic that comes in and out of there, not only from campers, but all from, also from park staff because that's where our service yard is and our office and headquarters. So by moving that path off of the road, that should ease congestion in that area. It'll uh, make for a safer route for visitors going up to the lighthouse. And then the Lake Michigan parking lot. I mean, this is something that uh, probably for 20 years now, we've been wanting to get the Lake Michigan parking lot repaved and expanded. This is the area that is in the blue rectangle. Um, I know since I got here, it was always a project that was like one or two years away. And then because of other needs throughout the system, we just never got the funding for it. So now here's that extraordinary opportunity to fix this up. So here's the current layout. Again, no paths in there, no way to get people from the warming shelter lot or the campgrounds over to the beach house. Um, just a lack of paths in general, um, probably an inefficient use of space there for parking. So we are going to be adding the paths that you've kind of seen in the other images to get people directly to Lake Michigan and along the whole shoreline on the west side of that parking lot. There'll be a walkway for people to walk there so they don't have to walk through the, the parking lot themselves. And then we're going to be um, increasing parking on the east side and on the north side as well. We can't go too far because we run into critical dunes and we have to obtain permits just like anyone else does when doing work in a critical dune area. Um, but we've made our case and, and we're waiting to kind of hear the results. We've had to cut out some parking spots that we had originally planned for on uh, kind of that north, northeast inner corner where it curves around towards the north, the parking lot. We've had to remove some parking spaces there, but we're hopeful that we'll be able to add additional spots in the area in red. We're also going to be crushing and reshaping the park road. So that's about two lane miles through the whole park. We're gonna end before we get to the Hamlin Dam parking area and the boat launch. Those are recent paving projects. They're holding up well. We didn't see the need to go in there and get that work done. But we're also going to be repaving or paving for the first time in some cases, some of the pull-offs that we have at uh, the Cedar Day Use Area and then in front of the park headquarters. We'll be adding uh, uh, an ADA parking space there um, so that people can park and get to the office as well. Um, this we're hoping will increase parking because right now without the lined parking spaces, the parking's pretty inefficient. Um, I think we can get more parking uh, spots in those spots without actually expanding the area in any way. And then down at the Hamlin day use area, um, this is how it currently exists. You know, another thing, you know, that's kind of the case in, in most of these areas, we've got a nice bike path that connects all of the campgrounds and then it just dumps you off in a parking lot and um, visitors are 
you know, charged with having to try to find their way over to the beach house while avoiding vehicles and bicycles. So we're going to add some uh, some connective non-motorized pathways that, you know, bicyclists and, and pedestrians will be able to use to get around the parking lot. And we're also going to be repaving that entire parking area as well. We're, and uh, one of the other highlights is we're going to have kind of a defined start to the island trail, a little bit easier. Um, for people who haven't been here that are looking for the island trail to be able to find that. And then the last project that we would really like to do, but it's going to be dependent on um, where the bids come in. Uh, we're bidding this as an alternate so that we can get it completed if we have enough funds in the project. If bids come in too high, we're going to have to postpone this. But we would like to regrade and pave we call the gravel lot. Um, I've heard other people call it part of the dam parking lot. Um, so we, we would right, like to get this regraded and paved. Again, there's that inefficiency with parking because we have no lines. We have bumpers there, but that didn't help too much. And also the way this is pitched, it dumps a lot of um, sediment and erosion from the parking lot down onto the trails that are below it. So we would like to get that pitched more towards the Northwest in an area that has no trails and uh, can actually take in that water. And then in addition to that, we're going to be replacing uh, the portion of the Skyline Trail. I mean, this was this was built in 1980. Um, park staff and the National Guard worked together with inmates to build this. Um, it's been a long time. Park staff for years have been uh, restoring it, replacing sections of it, but it's just getting to the point now where we can't keep up with it with the small staff as we have. In the past, there was an inmate crew that worked here. Um, that is no longer the case, so it's harder to keep up with it. So we need to upgrade this experience. The cost is expensive, and this is, again, one of those uh, you know extraordinary opportunities for us because these kinds of projects don't always score well when you're splitting a small pot of money amongst a lot of different state parks. So we're going to take advantage of that. Um, we're going to phase it into two phases, mainly due to funding. Uh, the first phase is going to take place in 24 and 25, and that's going to be the western half of the trail. So that's the amphitheater parking lot to the middle staircase. And then in phase two, which will be in the near future, we're going to replace the remaining eastern half of that and eliminate the middle staircase. And the middle staircase was installed because of the uh, Great Lakes Visitor Center that existed there. It was kind of a shortcut for our interpreters to be able to go from the visitor center up to the large overlook. We don't see, when it comes to the cost of redoing the structure, something had to give, and that was that was the item that we thought we could give up uh, to be able to fund this. So here's just a, one of the plans. As you can see, this is going to follow the existing path. We're not making drastic changes to this. Um, we are going to elevate the trail a little bit, and that's to accommodate some of the um, the windblown sand that occurs at the, the large open dune at about the halfway point. We spent a lot of time shoveling that area out, and so we're going to elevate it, and we're going to change the uh, location. The overlook's probably going to overhang that dune a little more than it does now, but we're generally sticking with the existing route, you know, which was the historic Skyline Trail. So this is the, the Skyline Trail as it exists today. So like I said, we're starting uh, construction. We're going to remove everything from the top and then start rebuilding from the amphitheater. And then just to give you a sense of the scale of this, um, that's the tall overlook that overlooks the river mouth. And then the pink arrow at the top, uh, that's where the existing middle staircase is located. So this is about 1,400 linear feet of boardwalk. It's an elevation change from the lowest point by the uh, amphitheater parking lot to the highest point, which are some of those big overlooks at the face of the dune of about 100 feet, a little over 100 feet. So it's a really big project, and um, it's going to take a lot, of, a lot of labor to get those materials up there. This is a, a sample or an example of, of what it might look like. This is a stairway that was recently installed at Hoffmaster State Park person who designed this is designing our structure as well. You'll see that those uh, fences on the side, those are there for a reason. Code has changed a lot since uh, the 1980s when the boardwalk was installed at the Skyline Trail. You can't have a gap any more than four inches wide. Uh, the railings need to be higher up than 
uh, the ones that we currently have on the Skyline Trail as well. So there are going to be some new code requirements that are going to change what it looks like. Um, here's another option of a, a fence option that we're looking at, thinking about maybe this is something we would want to do as well. So we're wrapping that up, hopefully going to bid soon for this project, and it should be able to start in the fall as well. So how is this going to impact the park for 2024 and 2025? It's going to have a big impact. We, we're going to be closing the park north of the Big Sable River for approximately 10 months. And, and the reason why we're doing this is, you know, number one, it's it's safety. Um, it's number re one reason by far. Um, there are just the construction footprint is too large to be able for us to be able to close off every access point. And we're going to have a lot of heavy equipment in here, asphalt haulers, gravel haulers, loaders, and there's no way that we can fence off every part of it or sign every part of it. And we've learned, unfortunately, that a lot of our visitors pay no attention to signs. We've had to kick people with, with our beach, uh, Beachwood toilet shower buildings. We would have them completely fenced off with signs and people would take the fence down and go in. And, and so we just, we can't risk any kind of injury to any of our visitors or, or anything worse. So that's gonna be closed uh, for safety. We also want the contractors to be able to work efficiently. That means getting them in and out of the park quickly. Um, if they have to wait 20 minutes at the gate while people are buying rec passports and trying to you know, get information about the park, that's only going to cost us more money. And we're already on a tight budget. And then the reason that we're closing in May and June, and, and I've seen some people kind of grumbling on social media about this, we're really beholden to the asphalt plan schedule. Um, you know, asphalt can only be laid in warm temperatures. Most of the asphalt plants in this area of the state don't open up until early May to mid-May, depending on what the, the weather's like. So we can get all the work done that we can, um, you know, in the fall and winter, but we really can't do those finishing touches until the asphalt plants open up again. So we're going to have to hold off on that. So impact uh, camping completely closed September 3rd, 2024 through June 30th, 2025. Um, you know, all of these, these dates could change a little bit if, you know, we get a contractor on board, and they're not able to start right away. If that happens, and if it's going to be for a long enough time period, you know, we may keep some of this stuff open a little bit longer. We may reopen some of the, the campsites um, for a couple of weeks if we can swing it. Um, the park staff has to do a lot of prep work before the construction, so we're still going to have to use some of that time, you know, dropping trees and, and doing other work, pulling signs. But um, you know, if we can, if 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 it looks like they're not going to start till October, we might be able to open up the campground for a while longer. And if we do that, there will be um, lots of information going out. Um, we won't just spring it on everyone. Um, we'll make sure that there's at least a couple week notice before the reservation system uh, starts up again. To allow people to go to give everyone an opportunity to uh, prepare for that so then the park's going to be closed north of the big sable river and that's going to include the hiking trails the boat launch that's a big one um, the beaches the hamlin day use area so the playground's not going to be open and the lighthouse as well uh, the skyline trail and that parking lot up there that's going to be closed once the skyline trail construction begins again we want to have a safe work environment for the contractors and we want to you know provide them an efficient space for working. Because of the um, the lack of parking in the park um, and the uh, closure at the Skyline Trail, we're not going to be doing amphitheater weddings or you know the church that rents out the amphitheater for services. They won't be able to do that during the closure window. I know a lot of visitors, a lot of people who live on the lake are staying at um, uh, lodges and, and places on the lake like to take their boats over to the Hanlon day use area use the beach, use the playground. That is not going to be allowed. Um, Lake Michigan, no boats allowed around the, the main day use area um, by the Lake Michigan Beach House either. And then this, I know this is a big one for some people I've received calls about this already. Um, access to hunting, you know, the hunting area that's north of the Big Sable River is not going to be made available via the main park entrance. So you won't be able to drive in to you know, up M116 or even park on the south side of the road and cross the Cedar footbridge or the dam. Those are all going to be closed off. Um, so you'll have to, if you want to hunt in the north area, you're going to either have to take a boat across or come in from Nordhaus Dunes. So this is what's allowed during the closure because there's still 
there's still 2,000 acres of this park that are going to be open and more if you include some of the areas to the north. So I'll just run through these on a map to show you um, what's going to be open. The three miles of shoreline along M116, that's all going to remain open. The south trails will remain open, except for the Skyline Trail during the construction there. But you know, for people who want to fish in the fall, um, they'll be able to access the south side of the Big Salvo River below the dam on those boardwalks. They'll just have to either walk in from the highway. Uh, you know, it's going to be a little bit bigger of a walk, but that's still going to be available. Uh, a lot of the the popular beaches on the uh, south side of the park on the the west side of Hamlin Lake you know feel free to go ahead and moor your boat or anchor there and use those locations the piney ridge trails um, those are all still going to be accessible the only thing that we ask is that you park in the existing parking lots um, be respectful of the people who live on piney ridge road you know don't park on their property don't park on park property that isn't a designated parking space and then carry in and carry out your garbage if you can. Um, we would love to put garbage cans there at those spots, at those trailheads. And, and we're, we're going to try it out. But what happens a lot of times when we put garbage trails in more remote locations is that uh, local residents who don't want to pay for garbage service will drop their stuff off at those locations and make us pay for it. Uh, so if, if we see a big uptick in that, we may pull those garbage cans. So if you if you can handle the carry in, carry out for your garbage, that'd be appreciated. So looking at the north end of the park, um, you know, we know that it's especially in the duck hunting season, it's a really popular area. Hunting in general in the north end of the park is really popular. And this is all gonna take place during uh, October, November, December. Um, so those areas are gonna be closed. So, but still visitors are welcome to boat over to the beaches and sand dunes on the, the northwest side of Hamlin Lake. Uh, Lake Michigan, we're asking you stay north of the Coast Guard Trail, but anywhere on the shoreline, if you hike in from Nordhaus Dunes, uh, if you hike in from Hamlin Lake, you know, all of that area to the north is available. So for, for people who want to hunt and have the ability to take a boat over there, you can do that. Or if you want to come in from Nordhaus Dunes, you can do that. You can even access a lot of the hiking trails from those areas. We just ask that you keep out of the area around the campground. So, you know, almost if you can run a, a line across the uh, Coast Guard Trail, across probably pretty close to the Hunt Line, a little bit south of there, please stay out of there. Uh, we're going to have that area signed and we will have staff patrolling. So we just ask that you keep out of there. Some additional considerations that we have with this is uh, we know there are a lot of people on Hamlet Lake. Um, that own places on Hamlin Lake that use the state park boat launch as the main way for them to get their boat in in the spring and out in the fall. And we're going to work with the, you know, the the homeowners. We're going to set some dates where, you know, probably on weekends if the contractor is not working. And we're going to make sure that we have an opportunity for people to get in there. And we'll promote this and announce it ahead of time. Um, we've got your researchers, um, the friends group, you know, has projects that they work on that we want to continue with, stewardship projects like for our invasive species. Um, we let the North Breakwater volunteers uh, for the North Breakwater Lighthouse, the people who, you know, staff that in the summer, they stay at the old manager's residence here. We're going to allow that. Splicka staff can come and go. We're just going to have to coordinate all of this um, to make sure that people are doing it safely. We're looking at an alternate route for Lake Stride that just follows the south side of the river that has a minimal change, you know, like a 20 or 40 feet difference that we can probably make up in other spots to allow that to happen in 2025. And we want to continue working with our fisheries division and charter boat association for the salmon planting. So um, we've already started conversations with our fisheries co-workers to make sure that that happens as well. So it's, you know, Things can change. Um, we haven't even gone out for bid with this project yet. Uh, we don't have a construction schedule in place yet. We have a time frame where we want the construction to take place, but once we get a contractor in place, they might have a different view of it. And so there's a chance that you know if the contractor pulls out in the middle of the winter and the conditions are safe for us to open the park, we might do that. Um, I really hope it doesn't happen, but if it doesn't look like the project's gonna get done on time, you know, that could happen as well. 
So the best place to to look for updates on the closures and openings is to go to the Ludington State Park Facebook page. Uh, we've got a pinned FAQ at the top of the page that we will update anytime we have additional information. We'll also post it in the, the main thread, but the final document's always gonna be pinned in that FAQ at the top, so you don't have to go digging for information. Um, we'll have updates on, updates on the closures, openings, the schedule, and we're gonna take a lot of photos to show the progress, you know, what's happening in the park while, you know, no one can get in there, you know, what what's happening on the Skyline Trail, um, what's the paving project looking like. Um, it's a really big project for us, and we're really happy about it and excited about it. We wanna share that excitement with you. Uh, the CVB has said that they will put together a Ludington State Park closure blog for people who do not use the social media. Uh, so they're gonna, we're gonna talk to them every couple of weeks and they're gonna be reviewing our Facebook page. So anytime we post something there, they can add that to their closure blog as well. So um, when that gets up and running, we'll post about it on our Facebook page as another resource. Um, and I'm sure, you know, CVB will put out some information about that. Lighthouse stuff and friends stuff, you know, the, their Facebook pages are the best places to go for information there. Splitka and the friends group also have dedicated websites. So you can check those locations out as well. Um, our official Michigan DNR Parks and Recreation Park Alerts page also makes regular updates when there's a major change. So, you know, a little bump in the schedule probably will be not will not be put on that page. However, if we are opening up reservations a month early because the project is completed early, that'll be very much highlighted on that spot. Um, and then because the, the road is going to be closed at, at the bridge, M116, you're not going to be able to get beyond that. And we're going to have it staffed. Um, we don't want it to look like, uh, you know, the administrative staff is just hiding back here behind the bridge. So we're going to be opening up the contact station, having staff down there, and either Dan or myself, we'll be down there um, putting together, doing some office hours so we can answer questions and, and just be available for anyone that wants to talk to us about anything. And of course, you're always welcome to um, reach out to me via email or to call the park. I'll do the best I can at answering questions. It's just right now it's early enough in the, the project that uh, we don't have it really locked in yet. But because of that six month reservation window, with, we had to make the, the call to close the park um, for Labor Day. So that's kind of where the project stands. And I thank you. Um, if we can open up for any questions, Patrick, if you're. If yes, does that. anybody. Um... If anybody has any questions, you can either put them in chat um, or if you want to um, unmute yourself and ask uh, Jim directly, you may do so as well. Um, Jim, thank you for uh, the slides. Uh, um, your graphics uh, definitely helped communicate the uh, scope of the problem and what you're doing. So uh, kudos to you for having put that series of slides together. Thanks. I wish I wish I could have used something that was a little nicer looking than paint. <laughs> whatever it takes yeah. um any any questions from anyone you have a question in the uh chat looks like lake michigan beach is accessible from the south up to the river is that correct yes that is correct yeah okay and you also have a question of would it be possible to utilize a sanitation station for the park entrance that is going to be, I, I believe that should be something that uh, is allowed. I have to look into that uh, a little bit further um, just because the concentration of RV chemicals, you know, if we don't have any other uh, water being used out there, um, I know some parks have run into issues with that. Um, I, I believe we should be able to accommodate that though. That area okay. will be open so people will be able to come in and get water. Yeah, and I don't also know if that question, Jim, was a reformatting in terms of where the booth is. Um, I know some people sometimes ask that, and there um, is a question similar to that in terms of, have you considered putting the entry booth south of the road into the Skyline Trail? You know, we talked about that. Uh, one of the issues that we have with that, though, is that that is a state highway, and it is owned by... Uh, the Michigan Department of Transportation, and they have the right of way in roughly 200 feet in each direction there. Um, so if we were to move the booth, there's a good chance that we would then have to um, 
expand our scope for the maintenance down there. And we don't have the equipment or staff for snow plowing, uh, sand removal. Um, and then also we've had discussions about this and it then we would also be responsible for maintaining the bridge. And that's another infrastructure item that we really do not want to add. Um, Jim, one of the questions that has been brought up in other forms um, about uh, 116 is that MDOT is planning on repaving that in 2025. Um, and there was some question raised in another form. I think uh, the question might have been asked at a Ludington City Council meeting of um, Brandy Miller from the Chamber Alliance about the timing of that. Can you comment on what um, MDOT is planning on doing with 116 and how that may or may not coincide with the project for the state park itself? Yeah, they, they moved the schedule up. It was originally planned to be 2026, but once they saw that we were going to be closed, they figured they could lessen the impact by moving that up to 2025. Um, and, and I'm not the final word on this. Um, you know, I don't know if Mark's on the call from MDOT, but you know, he may correct me if, if he is. Um, but the plan is to finish the design, I think in August tentatively, um, I don't believe the paving would take place until spring of 2025, probably May, June, when we're closed. Um, what they told us was they are not planning on, they will they will be keeping one lane open. Um, so there'll be a flag person or two at either end, um, letting people through. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's going to be an extremely long time. You know, the area of M1, because the, the paving project they're doing is going to be from Tinkham up to the bridge. And they'll probably start with the bridge and work back. And each like one and a half, two lane miles, I think is three to four days, they thought weather permitting. So um, it, it's going to impact us a little bit. It'll slow down traffic there, but it doesn't sound like they're going to close it completely. Okay. Um, someone asked a question, could, you, uh, could people buy their park pass at the sanitation station rather than a congested area near the river? Yes, I, I believe we, I mean, we probably won't staff that 100% of the time. Um, I would call ahead to the park and, and we can coordinate that. Um, but I totally understand that if it's congested, you might not want to drive all the way out to that entrance booth. Um, but that is the area, the entrance booth is where it's going to be staffed most of the time. Okay. Um, somebody commented that if the M116 was, um, done at the same time uh the state might be able to get a better deal on asphalt um, and we gotta let the contractors work that out um jim again thank you for the presentation tonight thank you for your continued management of the park and uh the team overall um i'd encourage anyone that's uh that is out to the park to please uh express your appreciation to the park staff for all they do to make the Ludington State Park, the jewel of the state park um, system. It certainly sees the high number of camp nights, number one in the state, and one of the most um, day use uh, campsite or campgrounds as well. And so again, Jim, please express our appreciation to the, uh, the staff for their continued due diligence in making the park all that it is. Again, thank you, Jim, for the presentation and everyone have a great rest of your evening.